we start with this historic day itself with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat of Rhode Island. Senator, I have to give you some good news for the Democrats. A new Gallup poll by USA Today, one day poll conducted Monday, that's yesterday, finds 49% say it's a good thing that Congress passed a health care bill, 40% say it's a bad thing. So times change, things change so quickly. Victory looks good to the American people so far. Your thoughts? I think uh, victory does look good to the American people. I also think that as they become more accustomed to this bill, as the president said, as it's reality, confront some of the rhetoric that we've heard about it, uh, they will learn some very important things about what this bill does. I think the Republicans have painted themselves into a corner if they want to run against us in November on opposing closing the donut hole for seniors, opposing uh, protecting children with pre-existing uh, conditions against the insurance companies that are denying them coverage, opposing $1.3 trillion in deficit reduction, opposing uh, tax credits for small business. It's, they put themselves in a tough position. Okay, let's listen to some of the president today as he signed the bill. Our presence here today is remarkable and improbable. With all the punditry, all of the lobbying, all of the game playing that passes for governing in Washington, it's been easy at times to doubt our ability to do such a big thing, such a complicated thing, to wonder if there are limits to what we as a people can still achieve. It's easy to succumb to the sense of cynicism about what's possible in this country. But today we are affirming that essential truth, a truth every generation is called to rediscover for itself, that we are not a nation that scales back its aspirations. You know, uh, Senator, I was just thinking, I'm trying to get beyond the cynicism of the people who just think everything is scorekeeping to real motivation in politics, real mission in politics. How's this fit with your goals in life? What happened today? This uh, is right down the middle. I come from Rhode Island. Rhode Island is a state with a lot of seniors and a lot of low-income seniors. So solving their greatest dread, which is falling into the donut hole for Part D prescription drug coverage, is a really important and fulfilling thing. I heard from a woman just the other day, Christine in Providence, about her 23-year-old son who she's scared to death about because he's out in the job, mar job market and can't get health insurance and he's off her policy. Christine's son will be protected. You have, you come from a state like mine, and this is all personal. It's all real. And that's what's been so frustrating about the demagoguery and the nonsense and, frankly, the flat-out lies about things like death panels. Now that it gets real and we have a real bill, I think we've got a wonderful story to tell. And more important, we can really deliver for the people at home who are living in this health care system and experiencing it failures day in and day out in heartbreaking ways. Really. The stories are just unbelievable, and, and this will begin to address them. Well, I wanted to get to that point in a bit more detail even than that, because, you know, when every economist, everyone who studied economics in college or grad school like I did, knows the importance of the stimulus bill that was passed last year. And yet, anecdotally, your party's lost the argument, because Republicans are able to say it didn't do anything, because you never sold it on the ground. Is that a lesson you have to not make, well, the mistake you cannot make this time? You have to explain the health care bill so it doesn't become evanescent like yeah, the, uh, I think the stimulus bill did. I think it's true. The stimulus bill achieved kind of a notoriety of its own. Republican governors and congressmen came to all the ribbon cuttings. They spent the money. They loved it. They sit, claimed the jobs that it would create when they applied for it. But once it was a stimulus bill, something generic, uh, they attacked it. We have to make sure that this stays close to home and that the real stories hit home. And I think we have a strong commitment from the White House to be persistent about getting that message out. And of course, the bill itself gives us a story that's Tell that is good in the real homes of real people and real families all over this country. How does the president use this uh, victory moment to grab hold of the hearts and guts of the American people? I know that you've got financial regulation coming up, which could be another one of those bills that becomes a little too Adlai Stevenson, a little too elite, uh, Woodrow Wilson, if you will, a little too elir, uh, elitist, if you will. It doesn't grab people. Wait a minute. The government's going to be a little bit Teddy Roosevelt here. They're going to grab hold of these big trusts and they're going to protect us. Uh, how do you grab that issue and make that coming issue into a, uh, a kitchen table issue? 
I think there are lots of ways for the president uh, to do this. Two that come to mind, bring to the White House some of the families of the children who have pre-existing conditions where dad and mom were trapped in their jobs because they couldn't move because they'd lose the coverage for their child with a pre-existing condition. Let them tell their stories. You know, it can be as simple as that. I think also yeah. at a more uh, political level, you know, one team worked very hard to try to fix a real problem for the American people. The other team demagogued it and lied about it. And I think independent voters, given the choice, even if they disagree with parts of the bill, will say, look, one team was in there trying, the other team was out there lying. We're for the team that's in there trying. At least they took us seriously as voters and tried to solve a real problem that we as citizens face. Is part of the problem, uh, the failure to get what we call bipartisan support, was that there aren't many bipartisan types left on the Republican side. You've got people like Chuck Grassley and Enzi, Mike Enzi from Wyoming. You've got a few out there, potentially, certainly Dick Luger, people like that who would be, and the two senators from Maine, who would normally be part of a, a, a coalition to get something done for this country, pragmatic coalition. But they're not enough in number. Is that and the problem? You just can't get enough of them so none of them break loose because nobody wants to be part of a small renegade group. Well, I think they also made a calculated decision as a party to hang together and oppose everything Obama proposed uh, for the purposes of basically trying to make him look like a failed president. Yeah. It was a calculated decision. They made it early. They stuck to it. It was a strategy. This was not just people being unwilling to come across the aisle. This was an actual strategy of refusing yeah. to come across the aisle. Well, and the refusing the same thing they I did think will pay at, a price. Well, then you're saying they followed the same strategy of rejectionism that they used back in 93, 94. More or less. I wasn't here then, so I didn't see it firsthand. But I think the combination of trying to deny Obama victories and trying to appeal to the very far right wing that is very important in Republican primaries uh, has driven them way off course from the American people. Okay, thank you so much, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us on this very historic day. U.S. Congresswoman Barbara.